Nu Metal has never been cool. It wasn't cool then, it wasn't cool now, and it probably never will be cool, at least in the eyes of the quote unquote tastemakers. <laughs> What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKinty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and welcome back to my What Killed the Genre series, where I look at genres that have fallen off in terms of commercial popularity, and I try to figure out what happened. Today, I'm gonna to talk about a genre that was once on top of the world, selling tens of millions of albums, filling stadiums all over the world, despite being maybe the most hated genre of music in recent memory. And that genre is nu metal. I even wore my Adidas hoodie for extra nu metal points. It's kind of hard to believe, even for me, and I was there, but back in the late 90s, early 2000s, nu metal bands were all over MTV, they were on mainstream radio, you know, Fred Durst was like a legit pop star. It seemed unstoppable. But then, all of a sudden, in I think maybe 2003, it just kind of hit a wall and very quickly died a swift and untimely death. And today, nu metal really Really is all but dead, at least at the mainstream level, and the critics, the journalists, the tastemakers, all those people still hate it as much as they ever did. But I think there's a little bit more to the story than what a lot of people say, which is, you know, new metal died because it was corny and people got tired of guys in clown masks and jumpsuits rapping over bounce riffs. Because although I do think that's at least partly true, like that is part of the reason why new metal died, new metal has been way more influential than I think a lot of people realize. It made some legitimately really important contributions to like heavy music and General that are still with us today. And for all of us rock and metal fans, even those of us who kind of didn't really like new metal, I think we all owe it a little bit of thanks for some of the things it left us. I'll explain exactly what I mean towards the end of the video. But before I do that, I just want to really quickly plug my Instagram. I've been posting there a lot more lately. So if you like this video or any of my other videos, I would love it if you give me a follow over there. There's a link in the description. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. Part one, when Korn opened for Sick of It All. The really interesting thing about new metal to me is that it kind of came out of nowhere, or at least that's how it seemed to me. My introduction to the genre was in 1995, when I saw a little band that I'd never heard of called Korn open for Sick of It All and Orange 9mm up here in Seattle. I had no idea who Korn was, but I could tell right away that they didn't quite fit in. They almost looked more like ravers or something than a band that would open for two New York hardcore legends. I really had no idea what to expect. I was thinking maybe they would be reggae or something. Then they played, and holy shit. <laughs> I had never heard anything like that. It was heavy as hell, but with a super tight, almost like funk kind of groove. Jonathan looked like he was getting electrocuted or something when he was playing. I remember by the end of the set, his pants were soaked in sweat down to the knees by the time they were done playing. I thought at first maybe he'd peed his pants or something. I still didn't quite know what to make of it. Like, was this metal or hardcore or something else that we didn't have a name for yet? I didn't know and I don't think anybody else knew. Of course my punk and hardcore friends who were there with me rolled their eyes and called it raver metal or whatever, but I didn't care. It was so fresh, so unique and heavy in a really dark way that was different from just anything else that was out there. I fell in love with Korn at that show and I've been a huge fan ever since and for the record, my favorite song is Ball Tongue. And I think my experience with Korn was kind of the story for that genre as a whole. It just kind of suddenly came into existence, blew everybody away because it sounded like nothing else before it and either you loved it or you really, really hated it. Part two, the big bang of nu metal. When we're looking at most other genres, the story is usually something along the lines of, so there was this really cool, vibrant underground scene going on for a few years, flying low under the radar until finally it got past the tipping point, it blew up and became mainstream. For example, how there was like the Florida underground death metal scene that started in the 80s and then blew up in the 90s. There was the New York City punk scene of the 70s that created the Ramones or the Misfits. The story of hip hop coming from parties in the Bronx and then exploding in the 80s. You know, you get the idea. But new metal was different, at least as far as I can tell. It didn't really come from any kind of existing scene or community. It just kind of suddenly materialized in the form of corn. I called this section the Big Bang because I think of it kind of like how Earth was this lifeless ball of chemicals for millions of years until suddenly a bolt of lightning struck that chemical soup and then boom, life just kind of emerged out of nowhere. And in this case, corn was the bolt of lightning and the chemical soup was the early 90s rock and metal scene that primed us for new metal to happen. 
And what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, you had the grunge bands like Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, and Soundgarden, who introduced a lot of really dark, heavy, emotional stuff into mainstream music. For example, the song Rooster, which is really, really, really dark, you know, that was all over Top 40 Radio. Another key ingredient was the quote-unquote alternative metal scene of bands like Helmet, Rollins Band, Rage Against the Machine, and so forth, that gave heavy music a much-needed dose of fresh, creative energy and basically killed off thrash as the dominant subgenre of metal. And lastly, there was rap. And in 1994, rap was relatively new as a mainstream thing. Dr. Dre's The Chronic in 1992 and Snoop's debut album in 1993 changed everything. They were to rap as Nirvana was to rock. Like, instantly, as soon as those albums came out, everything was different. They took it to a way darker, way more real direction than anybody in the mainstream had ever heard before. So when you kind of step back and look at all the pieces laid out like that, I think you kind of see that new metal had to happen, right? It was basically the fusion of all those things, but with an extra layer of darkness and aggression, and what Korn was doing just made so much sense in the context of mid-90s culture, and they were so damn good at it. And once Korn popped, it was off to the races. The explosion of new metal bands was inevitable. It reminded me a lot of how rock changed overnight after Nirvana broke. Like, as soon as Korn came out, everything else just sounded kind of dated by comparison. And everybody was tripping over themselves to either start a new metal band or add new metal stuff to what they were already doing. Part 3, The Voice of the Voiceless. Now, before I get into the various flavors of new metal, I want to take a quick step back because I think it's really important to talk about exactly why new metal struck a chord with so many people. Because I think this is also a big part of why it fell off a few years later. The way I see it, new metal blew up because it spoke to a group of people that nobody else was speaking to at the time. Basically, it was this group of people who just didn't quite fit in anywhere else. They were too angry for grunge, like they kind of liked Nirvana but wish they were heavier. They were a little too emo for metal and not urban enough for rap. New metal was for people who were, more than anything else, just angry. Angry because they felt left out, angry because they felt like everybody else was laughing at them or mocking them or looking down on them. I think of it like the stereotypical new metal metal fan in the 90s would be a kid from like Ohio or Indiana who didn't do great in school, didn't have a lot of friends, didn't feel that great about where his future was headed, and also didn't know what the fuck to do about any of that. So when they heard bands like Korn, Slipknot, and Coal Chamber, or later on Limp Bizkit or Linkin Park, it just made sense to them. It was guys like them making music for people like them. And guess what? There are millions and millions of people like them, so the genre blew up and fast. But here's the important thing to keep in mind. New metal has never been cool. It wasn't cool then, it wasn't cool now and probably never will be cool, at least in the eyes of the quote-unquote tastemakers. It's always been looked down on by the gatekeepers of quote-unquote good taste, like all the writers and reviewers and journalists, and it's always been socially acceptable to shit on new metal fans. And just to be clear, I personally don't think that's cool. I actually think it's pretty gross and classist, especially like when you think about it in the context of some snobby magazine writer who went to one of those $50,000 a year private liberal arts schools sitting at his desk in New York City calling Slipknot fans in Iowa white trash while he listens to Fugazi. I'm like, yuck. That's always how it's been for new metal. Part four, the explosion from roughly 1996 to 2001. Because Korn came out of nowhere and were so ahead of the game, it actually took a couple years for new metal to really take off. Their album came out at the end of 1994, but if I had to point to one year as the inflection point for new metal, I think it would be 1996. That's when Korn's second album, Life is Peachy, which is also, in my opinion, their heaviest album. It's when that album went to number three on on Billboard and the new metal trend really really kicked into high gear. Over the next few years, there was an absolute torrent of new metal bands. There's no way I could possibly name all of them, so please don't comment about how I missed this band or that band. This is not intended to be a complete list of new metal bands. I think of it as just a few different flavors of the larger new metal genre. First of all, what you could call just like vanilla new metal. I'm just gonna throw all the bands that did something more or less corn like into this bucket. The first one I remember getting any kind of traction was definitely Coal Chamber. But there were hundreds and hundreds of bands doing this, a few other notable ones being Soulfly, Kitty, Dope, and Dry Kill Logic, among many, 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 many others. Some of these bands did it well, but I think in general this stuff hasn't aged particularly well because these bands didn't really bring anything new to the table. So to me, all this stuff just kind of falls under like, well, why would I listen to this when I could just listen to Korn instead? Second, the rap metal flavor. I'm, 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 
The big dogs in this flavor of new metal were, of course, Limp Bizkit, who even eclipsed Korn and became the biggest new metal band by a pretty good margin. And again, there are way more bands in this subgenre that I could possibly remember, but P.O.D., I think, were maybe the number two band in this flavor. And then there was this whole other cohort of bands, maybe like the grimier side of rap metal like Snot and Head P.E., who never got big but still have a pretty dedicated fan base. And third, the industrial flavor. with probably the most notable ones being Static X, Spineshank, and Orgy, who actually went platinum with their first album. And I personally think this stuff aged relatively well, especially Static X, who still sound pretty good to me when I listened to it in 2019. And fourth, the guys in masks and or jumpsuits sub subgenre. Now, I'm obviously exaggerating a little bit here to make a joke, but it's kind of true. It kind of was its own little thing. The kings of this sub subgenre were obviously Slipknot, and check out my Slipknot video if you want to go deep on all things Slipknot. But there are plenty of other bands doing a similar thing, most notably Mushroomhead, Mudvayne, and Motograder. And although all these bands are actually really good at what they do, I think this particular flavor of new metal really hurt the genre's overall credibility because it came off as this very like WWE pro wrestling kind of thing to a lot of people. But getting back to what I said before, I think the WWE pro wrestling kind of vibe is actually also why it caught on with so many people. So it's a little bit of a double edged sword. And lastly, the so-called post-grunge bands. Basically, all those bands with names you can't Google because they're dictionary words like flaw, cold, stained, and soil. But anyway, I personally see these bands as a different thing from nu metal. I think they're maybe more under the hard rock umbrella. But I do think they're worth mentioning in this conversation since they definitely borrowed a lot from nu metal and there was a little bit of overlap there. I'm also not including a bunch of bands here that are often included on new metal playlists or under the new metal umbrella. Bands like Linkin Park, Deftones, Incubus, and System of a Down. I think of these not really as new metal bands, but as, you know, new adjacent rock bands. Like the post grunge bands, these bands were definitely borrowing from new metal and maybe even had a few songs that you could consider straight up new metal. But to me, they're a different animal. It's much less dark, much less angry and aggressive than that core new metal sound. I mean, compare this. Feeling so faithless, lost under the surface To this To me, those are two different things. Anyhow, the decade closed out with a few watershed moments for the genre that said a lot about how big it had become. First, the two Family Values tours in 1998 and 1999, which were headlined by Korn and Limp Bizkit and supported by artists who were huge stars in their own right, like Ice Cube, Incubus, Mob Deep, DMX, and Rammstein. And of course, Limp Bizkit's iconic set at the Woodstock 99 Festival, where people literally tore the venue apart while they played break stuff. A lot of people called this the moment when grunge was officially dead, and I don't really disagree with that. And that brings us to part five, the peak and fall of new metal from 2001 to 2003. Those of you who are old enough will remember exactly how big this stuff was. I mean, it was fucking huge. It's hard to imagine that today in a time where you rarely ever even hear a guitar on mainstream radio at all, but new metal was as big as it gets in 2001. Limp Bizkit had become the flagship band for new metal, and they were massive. Their second album, Significant Other, sold over 7 million copies, and their next album, Chocolate Starfish, the one with the butthole on the cover, sold 6 million copies. The song Nookie was on MTV just all the time. Fred Durst was a fixture on TRL and he was supposedly dating Britney Spears. He was a full-on pop star, which is kind of weird to think about, but it happened. But this was the beginning of the end for new metal and it had fallen off hard within the next year or two. As one example, Limp Bizkit's 2003 album sold 325,000 copies in its first week. Now, that's a lot of albums, don't get me wrong, but considering that their previous album sold over a million in its first week, that was a big disappointment and said a lot about where new metal stood in 2003. So what happened? Well, I think a few things were going on. The first was that by 2003, 2004, the big bands in the genre had either changed their style to something more commercial, like Slipknot did, or they put out subpar albums that just really didn't go over well, like the Limp Bizkit one I just mentioned. Second, and maybe even more importantly, I think people just got tired of the new metal image. It started to feel very contrived and inauthentic. 
I started to get the sense that there was a lot of what you could call manufactured angst for one. What I mean by that is that while Jonathan Davis's emotions and corn songs felt 100% raw and real, like nobody questioned that, you kind of got the feeling that a lot of the other bands were just going through the motions. They were trying to act like tortured souls, quote unquote, because that's what you're supposed to do when you're the singer of a new metal band, right? Same thing happened with grunge when you saw like Candlebox and Creed and people just don't like that. And aside from that, I think new metal was kind of getting attacked on two fronts, on the rap side and the rock side. Over on the rap side, as crunk and southern rap in general were taking everything over, seeing these rock dudes in like baggy cargo pants or jumpsuits trying to rap just felt really corny and embarrassing, kind of out of place with where the world was at by the mid 2000s. And then over on the rock side of things, this is when metalcore, when bands like Kill Switch Engage, Bleeding Through, As I Lay Dying, Avenged Sevenfold, when all those bands came along who checked a lot of the same boxes as new metal. They were heavy but melodic, and they had that dark emotional vibe, but because of their roots in hardcore, I think they felt a lot more authentic and relevant. Like basically they had the edge of new metal without the cringe factor that came along with it. And for the fans who were looking for something equally dark and emotional, but maybe a little less heavy, the fall of new metal was perfectly timed with the rise of emo with bands like Thursday, The Used and Taking Back Sunday exploding in the early 2000s. And for that core new metal fan who really just didn't want to let go, there was a whole new crop of post grunge hard rock bands like Breaking Benjamin, Chevelle, and the biggest ones of all, Five Finger Death Punch, who nicely filled the same slot as the vanilla new metal bands did in the 90s. And lastly, getting back to what I said earlier, I think there was a bit of an assassination campaign at work here too. Remember what I said earlier about how new metal was never cool, about how the reviewers and the journalists and the other quote unquote tastemakers always hated new metal and looked down on their fans and the genre as a whole? I think that became a factor here. I think there was a whole side of the music industry that was very happy to see new metal fall off and maybe even happy to help it die. Like in a thriller movie where the crazy nanny smothers the sick grandmother with a pillow while nobody's looking. And so in the end, new metal had a pretty short life, really only about five years in its prime. However, like a lot of things that burn bright and die young, it left a pretty impressive legacy that I think a lot of people don't really appreciate as much as they should. So the genre is essentially dead, but its influence is very, very much alive. Which brings us to part six, the legacy. Like I said earlier, for as much as the gatekeepers hated new metal, the people loved it. Korn, Limp Bizkit, Slipknot, and Linkin Park sold tens of millions of albums for a reason. While the tastemakers in New York were listening to Fugazi and writing snarky hit pieces about how trashy new metal was, an entire generation of kids all over the world were getting into heavy music via new metal. And these are the same kids who then went on to start all the metalcore, deathcore, and rock bands of the 2000s. And so what that means is that really new metal, I think, is the biggest influence for an entire generation of bands. And as much as the tastemakers don't want it to be true, I feel like they're slowly coming around and begrudgingly admitting that. Because after years of new metal being a dirty word, bands really started to embrace their new metal roots a couple years ago. I wouldn't maybe call it a new metal revival, but starting in, I think, 2011 or so, you started to hear some blatant new metal parts come into deathcore and metalcore. The one that really stood out to me as a high-profile example was Suicide Silence's album The Black Crown, which added some very new metal stuff like the creepy whispered vocals and the bounce riffs to the deathcore kind of formula that they were doing before. And some of the newer of Mice and Men songs wouldn't really sound too out of place on a Dry Kill Logic album. And then there's the whole crop of bands like Amur, Sworn In, Kane Hill, My Ticket Home, Siler, and King 810 that basically sound like an updated version of the Family Values 99 tour. That's a hundred thousand people in me, all with vendettas. Those who have killed a man, can I get a show of hands? But new metal made an even bigger contribution than all the stuff I just mentioned. It gave us what I think is arguably the biggest development in the last two decades of heavy music, downtuned guitars. Now this might not seem like a big deal, but it really is in my opinion, because when you're tuned to B, every riff sounds different. It drew a clear line in the sand between the previous generation of bands who played in the standard E tuning and the new generation that played in B, and now of course even lower than B. And it's important to note, it's not just metal bands. Even pop punk bands like A Day to Remember playing Drop C or B these days, and it draws a similar generational line between their generation and the bands that came before them. Because even if you're just playing recycled Blink riffs, a Blink 182 riff played on an eighth string is a totally different beast than that same riff played on a Stratocaster tuned to E, right? 
And speaking of eight string guitars, like I said, Korn is 100% hands down, no question, the band that puts seven string guitars on the map and then by extension, eight string guitars. They obviously weren't the first band to start using seven string guitars. Ibanez started making them in 1990 for Steve Vai and I remember Trey from Morbid Angel using seven strings in 92 or so, but they were definitely the first band to use them in music that hit a mainstream audience. I'm pretty sure millions of other guitarists had the same reaction that I did when I heard the main riff to Blind, which was, oh my fucking god, I need a seven string guitar right now. Really, I think the whole last generation of heavy music is pretty much defined by an emphasis on downtuned grooves, whether that's deathcore, metalcore, more progressive stuff like Gent, or like I said, even pop punk. It's all about that downtuned groove riff in one way or another, and I don't think we would have those without new metal. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live in a world without modern metalcore. So as much as I might roll my eyes at some of the corny, gimmicky stuff that new metal bands did, I still think the corn are absolutely brilliant, and I still thank the new metal gods for giving us the blessing of downtuned guitars. All right, guys, that's my version of the rise and fall of new metal. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. Are you one of the people that grew up on new metal and are happy to see its influence now? Or are you one of those people like a lot of my hardcore friends that hated it at the time, hate it now and are glad to see it dead? Do you agree with me that even genres like pop punk and gent owe somewhat of a debt to new metal creatively? Let me know what you think in the comments. And the other thing I wanted to get some feedback on is the kind of classist dynamic I talked about in the video where you've got the snobby journalists, you know, in the big cities where writing all these hit pieces about how awful new metal is and how all the fans are trash. What do you think about that? Am I blowing that out of proportion or is there something there? Let me know in the comments what you think. And like I said before, if you like this video or my other videos, I would love it if you give me a follow over on Instagram. There's a link to it in the description. And with that, I'm gonna sign off for now, but I will see you next time.